Hi, this is Jeff Alpin, The Big Game Hunter, and welcome to either Job Search TV or No BS Job Search Advice Radio, depending upon whether you're watching or listening to it. I like to bring on experts on different subjects to talk with you about things that I think you should hear from a different voice. And my guest today is Anna Tarkey, who is CEO of ECA, a specialized executive search firm. And he leads their private equity and venture capital practice, where he supports PE-owned, VC-owned, and other high-growth companies with filling C-level positions. Prior to founding ECA, Tarkey spent six years as a management consultant at LEK Consulting and graduated with an MSc in economics, finance from Stockholm School of Economics. And he's a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review and Forbes. And by the way, lives in Los Angeles. And we're going to be talking about his recently released book, Evidence-Based Recruiting, which from its title, you may think doesn't relate to you. But trust me, everything we're going to be talking about is the stuff that you need to hear as more and more firms follow the lead of the Facebooks, the Googles, and the others who are employing this kind of strategy. Welcome, sir. How are you? Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. I'm doing excellent today. Fabulous. So evidence-based recruiting. It sounds like one of those obvious things that we could figure out the meaning of. And I want to make sure that we talk about it in a way that everyone gets. So what the heck is evidence-based recruiting? Evidence-based recruiting is more of a data-driven approach to recruiting. And the analogy I use is that 20 years ago, the old saying in marketing used to be half of my spend is wasted. I just don't know which half. And today it's almost unimaginable that you deploy a large marketing budget without tracking the effectiveness of, of that budget. And executives at Amazon that I talk to, they tell me at uh, recruiting is going down the same path as marketing. Every year, we're becoming more data-driven and more evidence-based in how we find candidates and how we evaluate candidates for a job. So applying this to the job hunter side of this, firms are not employing, necessarily employing the, the old-time approaches of casual conversation and chit-chat to figure out whether or not to hire you. They've, they're developing metrics to determine whether or not you're a reasonable fit and have a probability of success in their organization. Is that a good summary? That is an excellent summary. Of course, I would say that, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, folks, we also, haven't prepared this. <laughs> I would also take it one step further and say a lot of the so-called old school firms that I talk to and old school executives that I talk to, uh, they tell me, ah, Jeff, you never know. You could find a great candidate anywhere. They could have any type of a background or any type of a profile. And they just kind of like are more focused on, oh, when I see a great candidate, I know it. But the companies that are uh, applying a more evidence-based recruiting, they care about the chances of finding a good candidate. What is kind of like my hit rate on this pool of candidates with these types of backgrounds or these keywords in their resumes? So if you're a candidate and you want a job at those companies, you better be paying attention to including those types of keywords. And if you know that you want to land a job at Google, the road to getting there doesn't start this week when you're writing your resume and uploading your resume to their website. It starts five years ago when you're building those key skill sets in your resume so you're even qualified for those keywords. Fabulous. And to use an example from your book in a different venue, um, for those of you who know baseball, it's the concept of money ball. It's the notion that there are undiagnosed or unobserved characteristics in players that yield a greater probability of success. Huh? Huh? Am I good? Yes. <laughs> you are very good. And if you haven't watched the movie Moneyball, you have to watch it for nothing else, just because Brad Pitt looks fantastic in that. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are other reasons, but no matter. Um, so for a job hunter, I heard you say 
what we've done up until this point, the last five years become critical for demonstrating the potential fit for these organizations that are employing this strategy. Do I have that right? Absolutely. You need to build those critical skill sets that they're looking for, and you need to demonstrate those skill sets on your resume. So half the battle starts even before you go to the interview nowadays. And thus, it's important to research what those are that these firms tend to look for if you want to be sought by them, right? Exactly. exactly. And it is sought by them as opposed to, we're running an ad and we want to see 5,000 resumes and our systems are going to weed it down to 15. Again, it's sought by them, right? Yes. Yeah, so what, what is changing in the recruiting field is you're absolutely right. Um, companies are moving away from the post and pray method where they post a job position on a job board and then they get on their knees and start praying that a lot of people are going to apply for that job to actively reaching out to the candidates that they want. And they use LinkedIn and other job search sites to look for specific keywords, traits and attributes in the candidate's background to produce a smaller list of candidates that they reach out to because recruiters only have 24 hours in a day like anyone else. And on job boards, they're getting hundreds of applicants, but 90 plus percent of those applicants are not qualified. And recruiters want to make sure that every single person they are reaching out to, at least on paper, is qualified. So they rather would prioritize the people that they've reached out to themselves over the folks that are applying to them over job boards. And you used the phrase that I thought was really interesting that I took the time to write down. Traits and attributes. Now, is attribute a skill set? Is it a reflection of the keywords? And thus, what are traits in this? Very good question. So you can talk about kind of like different um, attributes the way I think about it. Part of positions you've had, the specific roles you had, the skill sets you had. Now, when we're talking about traits, this is about softer skills. How fast did you get promoted between your different positions? Great. What volunteer activities did you participate in? What type of language do you use when you're describing yourself and your experiences at these firms? That's more of a trade for me. Thank you. And language that you use to describe your background. Again, interesting phrasing. I'm not used to thinking in terms of. So could you give an illustration of one firm that might look for particular languaging versus another firm? And you don't have to identify who the client or company might be, but I think it'd just be helpful. Absolutely. So we've seen evidence-based recruiting firms or firms that apply an evidence-based approach to their recruiting. They look more when they're looking at resumes they look for people who are results oriented and they're thinking about the impact that they had in their past roles. So when you're writing your resume, you want to say, when I was the director of marketing at this company, I managed to improve uh, the margins by X percent, or I managed to bring in X million dollars of revenues for this company. Um, and that's a result oriented person. They do not want someone who's activity oriented. So they don't want you to kind of like make an inventory of all the responsibilities you have. When I was a director of marketing, I managed six people and I was responsible for the print ads at magazines. I was responsible for display ads. I was responsible for billboards. And their logic is who cares that you're responsible for all those things. What I do care about is what results you produce. And just to be clear, I could see some of those people doing the bad stuff. Um, continuing on to talk about results, almost like an answer to a behavioral interview question, where they start off with contextualizing what they were responsible for and then going into results. Or do they just want to see the results? Yeah, so <laughs> one, one, one of my old mentors used uh, an analogy and he said, when I go and buy a car, all I care about is that the, this car can make a great room room when I'm <laughs> stepping on the gas pedal. And all these car salespeople, they want me to kind of like pop up the trunk and take a look at the engine. And I don't care about for how the engine is built. I don't know a single thing about an engine. What I, the first thing I care about is how fast can this car go? 
And that's what they want to look, look at at the resume. The first thing they want to see is, did you produce results or not? If you did, then you're qualified to come talk to us. Now, the fact that you manage three people or 17 people is less of an interest. Interesting. So if you don't know whether a firm is evidence-based or not, and you're submitting a resume, is it safer to assume evidence-based or not evidence-based? How would someone recognize the difference? I would say that when you're applying for large tech companies, it's safe to assume they are evidence-based. When you're applying for a lot of other large companies, it's safe to assume that more and more of them are becoming evidence-based every year. So even companies like Nestle and Schneider Electric and Walmart are becoming evidence-based in their recruiting approaches. But when you're um, applying for a job at a mom and pop shop, it's safer to assume that most of them are not evidence-based. In fact, I'd say three quarters of the smaller companies don't even measure the effectiveness of their hires, let alone their hiring methods. Thank you. So on the institutional side, when they're conducting an evidence-based approach, how do they go about doing it? It starts with trying to understand- I know this is an enormous answer. Because <laughs> having read the book, I know how big this can be. Please, thank you. So I would say there, there, there are two steps into the evidence-based approach. One is to understand what really works. It's uh, kind of like when if you compare it going to the doctor. You go to the doctor and say, hey, I, I have back pain here. You don't want the doctor to say, Jeff, that's great. We'll set up a 20-year-long double-blinded study to find out why you have back pain. That's a scientific approach. Most companies are not applying that scientific approach to their recruiting in terms of kind of like collecting their own data and understanding the fact base. What they're doing is that they're understanding the fact base and distilling that like a doctor is doing an evidence-based approach to making real-time decisions. And there is a big distinction between that and companies like Amazon and Google who are also measuring every single thing internally and they are also improving the scientific fact base for how they make decisions. So there is a small distinction there that there are some companies that are kind of like measuring every single criteria and creating the internal feedback loop for that information and companies who can only rely on external information and follow best practices that is advertised externally. So let's say I'm Ms. Hiring Manager and I decide I'm doing a fact-based approach, there are certain attributes I can measure in terms of successes in my previous hires, failures from my previous hires, things I did in the evaluation process that hit or missed, <coughs> excuse me, and then from there start to distill a formula for considering a first cut so you can test it. Got that? Is that yes. My goodness. I, I You're retained. absolutely correct. And a, a big part of an evidence-based approach is the quantitative factors. So how well you performed on certain assessments that they provided you or how um, fast you were promoted in your last roles. But an evidence-based approach still has a qualitative factor as well. So in fact, if you're applying for a job at Amazon, they will make you go through all these assessments. They will kind of like look at your resume and they have algorithms for evaluating your resume, et cetera. But they also have you interview with hiring managers and they have you interview with five folks. And in the end of it, the hiring manager will still be able to override the computer formulas. They might kind of like say, based on all the test scores, we are assessing that this person is going to have a 17% likelihood that they're going to be successful in the role. But if you saw something amazing in this candidate's background, you can override that and still hire them. Interesting. So for uh, Mr. or Ms. Job Hunter, who's now out interviewing, are there signals that they can pick up during the interview that an evidence-based approach is being utilized for their evaluation? other than they, they're interviewing at Amazon, for example, other than they're interviewing at some of the major tech startups? Yes. 
So I would start with researching uh, what the interview process of every company entails that you're applying a job for, especially if they're an evidence-based company. Amazon has a set of tests that they make you go through. There's a ton of information online if you just Google it or go on Glassdoor and they talk about, they made me take these types of tests and they might not tell you what the test questions are, but they'll tell you what type of a test it was. So you can mm -hmm. prepare for those tests. And the second part is that even if they, they do make you take these assessments and tests, they also do care about the qualitative factors. So Amazon has this distinct culture and they call that being an Amazonian. Google has a distinct culture. They call that being Googliness or your Googliness as a candidate. Mm -hmm. And I would, my advice to candidates, candidates is be truthful to yourself. Do not say things that are not true about you. But if there are attributes about you that do overlap with being an Amazonian or having that Googliness in you and your, your personality, you do want to emphasize those things because those are the things that the interviewer is listening for. And, and folks, the idea that um, you should hide these things because you've been trained in non uh, Amazon or non-Google environments to shut up and do what you're told, regurgitate a bunch of stuff when we tell you to do it. This is the time to unleash the giant within you, to, to use the Tony Robbins title uh, for one of his uh, series from many years ago, to let it out and let them see it. Uh, because those qualities go beyond what you know, what you've done, what your successes are and also who you are is part of the evaluation, right? So my question to candidates who are hiding a big part of themselves in job interviews is, you only have one life. Do you really want to live it pretending to be someone else uh, that you're not? Or would you rather find a company that appreciates you for the person you are and the strengths you can bring to the table? I do the same work as a coach. You know, so, so many people have been trained to behave, which is one of the dirty words I think of uh, from a career standpoint. Uh, behaving to me is bad. You need to be in environments that support who you are and who you want to become and not become compliant and docile. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> and you and I are laughing because we know so many people who do this. Absolutely. Unfortunately. So, unfortunately is right. Uh, and they have careers that leave them dead from the neck up, unfortunately. Um, so for the job hunter here, how should they be conducting themselves with an evidence-based recruiting organization or an evidence-based uh, corporate co culture that will allow them to be seen, visible, found, succeed on the interviews. Boy, I'm tossing you a big question here. How should they conduct themselves? Going back to the basics, uh, prepare yourself for the interview. Know that there will be assessments there. Know that what type of assessments there will be. Um, prepare for those so that you can uh, kind of like perform at your very best. Know what types of softer questions they might ask in the interviews and prepare for those interview questions. I'd say the biggest mistake I see candidates doing going into an interview, whether it's an evidence-based company or not an evidence-based company, is that they think they can wing it during the interview. And we see an enormous difference in the performance of our candidates that we present to the clients who prepared for the interview versus those who don't. We actually offer to some candidates, if you want to do a mock interview with us, we'll do a mock interview with you to prepare you for kind of like the general interview questions that tend to come up in most of the interviews. There are kind of like 20 to 30 questions that keep coming up in every interview. Why are you interested in this role? What are some of the roles you've enjoyed in the past? What did you achieve in your past role? And candidates who take advantage of that mock interview tend to perform so much better than candidates who don't um, prepare themselves. As I tell the people I coach, LeBron practices seven days a week during the season. And every great entertainer I know rehearses. But job hunters go on interviews and the first time the words ever come out of their mouth are at the interview and they wonder why they don't perform well. <laughs> Makes Absolutely. no sense. So you're saying mistake number one is lack of uh, practice and preparation. 
what else can they do or not do to get ready for an evidence-based organization? That's a very good question. I would say um, practice and be prepared. The second piece is be truthful to yourself because regardless of if it's evidence-based or not, you, you do want to come in and be prepared. Um, you do also want to be at, it's more important than in the past to be responsive and be on your best behavior and be professional. Because more of these evidence-based companies are using algorithms to look up kind of like small errors in a resume, typos, signs of not being professional. And the data is showing that if people are displaying signs of being unprofessional during the job interview, they'll perform worse on the job. So those signs are becoming ever more important and they're not slipping through the cracks as often. So be more responsive and also be more professional at all times. And when you use those examples, it sounded like sloppy. Yes. Lazy. Um, and, and the classic thing that used to be, you only get one chance to make a first impression. And um, it sounds like you get one chance professionally to create that impression and get past machine evaluations. Yes. So, there's so many different directions I can go on now. Um, people sometimes from a language standpoint like to create these lengthy, complicated types of answers that drone on forever. I get the idea that in an evidence-based environment, simple is better than complex. Am I right about that or wrong? Absolutely. Whether it comes to your resume, or in your interview questions or answers. The simpler answers and the shorter answers are better. Um, you asked about the number one mistake candidates do in an interview and I told you it's coming unprepared. Mm -hmm. The second um, most common reason why candidates get turned down in jobs that they're qualified for is that they are verbose during the interview. I think that goes hand in hand with the lack of preparation, but someone who's verbose and is trying to kind of like, if you can't kind of like display signs of being a high performer and you don't have a quality message, you tend to replace it with quantity. You just keep <laughs> blabbering on and on and that doesn't go across well with employers. We, we live in an ADHD culture and it, this is short attention span theater. I, I tell the people I coach, an answer should be a minute to a minute 15 tops. It provides a framework for follow-up questions that you're guiding them through uh, to through your answer, but you're not throwing a fire hose out at them where they have to take down all that water so much because no one's going to listen. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you a question. So you give them this pointer and you tell them an answer should be a minute to minute 15 tops and you interrupt them two or three times during their interview and say, you know, that answer, it went on for three minutes or it went on for five minutes. They're like, okay, okay, I got it. And then they start practicing a little bit. And when they're talking to you, they're all right. You send them off to interview somewhere with, for a job. They come back. They didn't get the job. And you ask them, did you get any feedback? Yes. Why didn't you get the job? They told me I'm verbose. Why is it so that people then can practice for it, but then when they show up to the job interview, they still let their guards down and they become verbose again. And I found that this is one of the things that even when people practice for it, uh, very often they're not able to correct that behavior during interviews. And, and to me, the issue comes out to inadequate practice. I found over the course, I've worked in search for 40 plus years before going into coaching. And to me, number one is the skills needed to find the job are different than those needed to do a job. And a person just has to concede the point that even if they've been a hiring manager, they're an, uh, an amateur from the standpoint of interviewing for themselves. And they really need to remember all those people that they rejected who didn't shut up who over-talk their answers, and they have to practice the minute 15 with 
an alarm on their phone to get used to it. Usually they make the mistake because they're nervous. They haven't prepared adequately and they don't have the mental clock that ends at about a minute 15, as I just did with my answer. <laughs> because I know there's a limit to how long people are gonna listen. What I, haven't I been asking you about that we should cover today? Because there's so much in here. But again, thinking about it from a job hunter perspective, what else should we talk about today? If you're applying for a job at an evidence-based company, we talked about how important it is that you start the journey a few years before even you apply for that company by building up those skill sets in your resume. But it doesn't stop there. When you're preparing for your interview, take a second look at the job description because the hiring manager took a, an hour or two to put that job description together. And there they are writing exactly what they're looking for. A lot of candidates forget that when they show up to the interview and the hiring manager asks them, what makes you a great fit for this role? And the candidates again winging it. Go back to the key traits that are true for you and talk about those and say, I saw that it's very important that you have digital marketing experience and I have superb digital marketing experience. But I also saw that it's very important that you have experience with um, print advertising. Unfortunately, I don't have that, but I'm really excited to learn about that. And if you can speak back to the points that they're talking about in the job description and which of those traits that you do have, which of them you don't have, and which of those that you do want to invest in learning more about and energizes you, you've kind of like gained a huge competitive advantage against all the other candidates. Now, I'm gonna leap on your answer here because you gave a great example of the person who doesn't have all the major points of the job description. And they still got in the door. Yes. That's the beauty to this. They still got in the door because there was enough of something that drew the, the organization to them. See, normally I'll tell people the job descriptions are 80% accurate because most of them are created in the lazy way. The lazy way is someone gives notice, a manager calls to HR and goes, you got that job description we used to hire Adam? Yeah, he just gave notice and we got to replace him. So can you get this out of our, our resources and get to work on filling this for me? And can you have anyone in my office next Monday? That's the lazy way. And like your example of we don't know which 50% is the ones that work and versus don't work, I think most job descriptions are 80% accurate. Uh, so I'll tell people when they first start the conversation, thanks so much for making time to speak with me today. I recall the position description, but I want to get your take on the role. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me about the job as you see it and what I can do to help so that in this way you know what the target is today that they're looking for? Because sometimes it's different than what's in the document. And this way they can kind of speak to what it's like right now in the manager's thinking. Absolutely. I would even take that one step further and say, mm -hmm. what would you like to achieve with this role? What does good in this role look like? What is the output that you want? And this person might tell you that what I want is to get more customers. I want more revenues coming in the door. And I described it this way in the job description because I think that's the most efficient way of getting to the revenues. But if you as a candidate know even a better way of getting to the same results, that's phenomenal. Now you've kind of like educated the, your hiring manager on something they didn't know. Excellent. I normally have them ask that kind of question at the end, but I could see for an evidence-based firm, it's better to ask it at the beginning. Excellent. Ada, thank you so much for making time today. How could people find out more about you, the book, um, your firm? Tell Go us to our website. It's eca-partners.com. And if you want to contact me, you can click on my name and my contact details are there. If you want to find out more about my book, you can go to amazon.com and look for my name, Atta Tarki, A-T-T-A-T-A-R-K-I. -T -T -A -T -A Beautiful. And folks, we'll be back soon to talk with you about some, some other element of job search. I'm Jeff Alpin, The Big Game Hunter. Thanks for spending time today. And if you're interested in me and the work that I do, visit my website, TheBigGameHunter.us. I've got a ton there that'll help you. Hope you have a great day and take care.